everyone. Thanks for joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Sorreo, and joining me today in studio, my good friend, the president and CEO of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Eileen Hupp. Eileen, always good to see you. Thank you so much for having me today, Maria. Well, we have a very special show for you today. Normally, the Chamber mm -hmm. would do two events mm -hmm. for Citizen of the Year and for a Salute to Business. Mm -hmm. This year, you're sort of catching up from last year, and so we're going to combine the two events, and we have the opportunity actually to talk to all of the honorees. And here are the honorees this year for Citizen of the Year. I think at the beginning, <clears throat> when it first hit us, it was really, um, I mean, fear was the major emotion that hit so many people, right? <clears throat> the unknown, nobody knew what we were talking about. And as, a, as an ICU doctor, um, I pride myself on <clears throat> having a handle on everything and anything, you know, being able to know how to meet a challenge head on. And um, we had never experienced anything like this before. So um, to be in that, that space where you don't have control of the situation, um, it's really, really uncomfortable for, for doctors like me to, to be in that space. The biggest challenge is just making sure that we're doing what we need to do to make sure that we protect ourselves, which in turn protects the community really from the virus. So making sure that we have the proper protective equipment, making sure that we're taking those extra steps that we normally wouldn't do in a in a you know in an emergency situation where we have to take those extra 30 seconds we're cops our, our job is to rush in and catch bad guys and in uh in a situation like covid the toughest part for me really was trying to overcome that and taking those extra 10 seconds 15 seconds donning a mask maybe putting on gloves and stuff like that this this area particularly has a lot of uh, international travelers and so very early early on in 2020 uh, we started to get cases. We didn't know what it was or sort of how, fa how fast it spread. Uh, we didn't know how deadly it was, what the fatality and mortality rate was. Oh, it was very hard. <laughs> it was like probably one of the hardest things I've ever been through in my life because um, being in charge of the department, um, I'm trying to organize everything and it, it's constantly changing we have to like open different areas think of new ideas um, while trying to uh, like keep the morale up for the staff and we were just overwhelmed it was definitely different um, you know we we're doing our briefings out in the garage um, we were trying to social distance as much as possible we were cleaning everything to make sure everything was sanitized and we weren't transmitting anything between us. We're, we're very hands-on uh, just by nature and we tend to end up very close to the people that call us. Uh, physically there's, there's really not a lot of way to mitigate that so, um, so we really had to reinvent how we approach uh, calls. I specifically remember when everything really changed for us here in the hospital. I remember that we admitted the first uh, COVID in the ICU and then suddenly it hit. And I remember the night before I was documenting my journey and um, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and I just thought to myself, my life and my career are about to change forever. And I knew it, it was a gut feeling. And I remember walking up the walkway to the front of the hospital and knowing I have no idea what's gonna lie behind these doors. I really don't. I didn't have a whole lot of confidence in what I was supposed to do. I knew I could do it, but I just didn't know what it would look like. And everything changed. I mean, the sense walking into the intensive care that day. So we're a closed unit. I walk through the unit, you know, swipe my badge, walk in, and I remember seeing the patient on the other side of the door. There was one day that particularly haunted me because I was looking at like a grouping of beds and it was just sick, 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 sick. And um, they were under 50. There was like a large group of a cluster that was under 50. And I was watching the strong, he was maybe, this guy was in his 40s. I was watching the strong like 40 year old man struggle to breathe. We were proning him, we were working on trying to prone him to help him breathe better. And he could turn himself, but the strong man that didn't have any other pre-existing conditions, struggling to breathe. And I just looked at him and I was just like, and I just remember looking at him like, we're gonna get you feeling better. We're, it's gonna get better. And he's just looking exhausted from trying to breathe. That's when I'm like, wow, this is, 
This is really scary. We're first responders, that's what we do. We go out and we, we handle calls for service. We don't have a choice and we don't want the choice. We signed up for it, right? Yeah. So during the pandemic, we're just, we're just gonna go. And as far as making adjustments and stuff like that, like I said, protect, personal protective equipment, having extra information in our calls, if somebody potentially tests COVID positive, those are things that we had to be concerned with or to keep in the back of our mind or be aware of. But essentially, again, our job is to go catch bad guys and help people. Well, it's the way we do it in the fire service. We always adapt and overcome. That's, I think that's the, that's the term that you'd probably hear most in the fire service. And it's been changing since day one. I think we've adapted well and we'll continue to until you know whatever comes next. We're still out here doing our job. We're still um, trying to pull over bad guys. We're still trying to bring people to jail. It really didn't change very much for us. Uh, it, for us, a respiratory illness is a respiratory illness, whether it's the flu, whether it's a rhinovirus like a common cold, whether it's a coronavirus, uh, all of those are managed the same way. So um, you know, we we're called to respond to everything. So we, there's nothing we won't respond to and nothing we won't try to handle. I, I love what I do. And so yes, I was running on adrenaline. Every day that I walked into the unit, every day that I opened the door to another COVID room, you know, donning you know, my whole gear, which felt like 10 pounds at the end of the day. Um, I knew that I was there for a purpose to care for the patient. And it, it looked very different, it felt very different, but adrenaline and passion was exactly what kept me going and kept me coming back each and every day because I knew that these patients needed us in a whole different way than we were ever trained to do. So I'll preface this and say that for a very long time, we were in the middle of a very dark tunnel. Um, all of us nurses in this hospital fought a battle that we didn't, we didn't want to, but we knew we could fight, but it was very dark. And then suddenly just a little bit of light started to come through. And I remember the pivotal moment for me was when we had extubated, meaning taking the breathing tube out of our first COVID patient. I mean, and you want to talk about, I mean, complete and utter happiness and joy for a patient and their life and their family. That was the moment. We sat outside of his room and it's like, I just felt compelled at that very moment to like, give him a huge thumbs up. I looked in his eyes and like, you did it. Like, we did it, you did it. And we just danced and it, it kind of was like this, it was coined the, the COVID dance where I would just come and dance in front of the, the patient's room because I felt like this is exactly what we needed. You know, like um, we, we lost so many patients. We saw so many, you know, sick patients that weren't with their families for months at a time. And so to see a moment like this where suddenly we get to extubate a patient and then that patient went on to be downgraded, moved out of the intensive care. And then we did an honor walk. And I'll tell you, I mean, you want to talk about filling up my tank of passion. Oh, it was tremendous. It was absolutely tremendous. So he was um, our first patient to be admitted to ICU, have a breathing tube placed, make it out of the ICU, and then go home to his family. Um, and I felt like we should celebrate it. We all did. We we're like, we have to celebrate this. Like, this is a moment that we should never forget. Because no matter how dark this battle is, no matter how difficult this battle is, these are the moments that we have to hang on to because it reminds us nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, all of us on the front lines that we can do this. Um, it's hard, but we can do this. You gotta dig deep. And I remember coming down the elevators, we wheeled him down and he, he walked down the walkway to his wife who he hadn't seen in I think about two months. And the emotion involved in that was just like, it was very overwhelming. And that was, that's the moment I still go back to. You know, even now when we have COVID patients admitted, I look back on these moments where we truly did something good for a patient. You know, we worked really hard and we didn't win them all, but those few wins are something I'll always hold on to, always. I've learned that the most powerful thing that we can do as a nurse is be there emotionally, spiritually for the patient. You know, in medicine, it's obviously common knowledge that um, we have every device, every medication to keep a person alive. We do, 
you know, in the intensive care, we practice that every day. Um, but I think the greatest thing that I, cha I guess the biggest challenge I had in COVID was the fact that I didn't have family with me to learn more about a patient. And I realized how important that is in the treatment of a patient, is to get to know the patient that's laying in that bed for more than what is just written in their medical chart. Because all of us have a story. Every single person that walks in the door has a story that makes them their unique self. And learning that story is a huge part of helping them succeed and get out of the intensive care and out of the hospital. And there were days that, you know, I don't even know if my patients could hear me and I would just stand in there and talk to them. Tell them, you know, you're in good hands, you know, you're never alone. We're always gonna be there for you. I'd ask the family on the phone, like, tell me about him. What did he do? What makes him tick? You know, what did he do for a living? He's 80 years old, tell me his life story. I wanna hear it. And they'd always stop and be like, why do you wanna know all this? And I'm like, because I wanna know who I'm talking to in the room. You know, like, some of them are awake and can see me and they're probably wondering, who is this woman where they, sh they can only see my eyes, nothing else. It's gotta be so disorienting. I said, tell me about them. If they can't tell me, tell me about them. And, and I think that that's like one of the most important lessons I learned and that I will honestly carry through every day of my career is, yes, I, I can do things. I can titrate drips, you know, to save your life. You know, we can put in devices to, to help function and circulate blood to the rest of your body. Yeah, we can do it. But if you don't know your patient, are you really helping? And so it's really helped to get to know my patients. I love hearing their stories now. I mean, I feel like at the end of my career, I'll write a book on all the stories I've heard of my patients because some of them are outstanding, truly outstanding. I felt like this was our role as first responders. Um, we were the pillars of the community. They were looking to us and my husband understood that, how important this was for us to be there for our community and um, we were on the front lines and um, the South Bay needed us, so we had to rise up to that occasion. We were running out of masks and we were instructed to um, save a mask. I think it changed, it changed every week, weekly. Uh, sometimes we would save a mask uh, for a week and then discard them sometime. And then it changed to like just a new mask every day, which was nice. Um, and, and to save that between patients and to handle it with care because we don't want to like contaminate our hands while putting it back on our face, stuff like that, um, that was hard. Because then, um, then I, at that point, then I'm becoming protective of the staff. But we did the best we could. That This is what, na it was a national shortage. I, I mean, I, um, I could never be prouder of my coworkers and our leadership staff, um, you know, the managers and directors, um, everybody, because we, uh, I distinctly remember um, our VP, Shanna Hall, just saying, this is our time, you know, we have to rise. And we did. Um, I'm so proud of the people I worked with. We came together and we put our hearts into um, our care to our patients. We really did. I am grateful that I have a career that, um, that I can help people and hopefully make a difference in people's lives. So. I think that's what I held on to. Like, we're making a difference. We are helping people. This is why we became nurses and doctors and EMTs and all of that. I have two things to say about the kindness. And, and part of it's with patients, part of it's with the community. Um, there is a long period of time in the beginning of COVID where the amount of time that it would take for us to degown, clean up, do everything, you know, by the time you had time to sit down and eat, it's like you have five minutes and then you go home and you're exhausted. And so the last time thing you were thinking about was like making food, making meals, prepping meals for the week because you're just on overdrive. And by the time you get home, you just fall and you succumb to whatever your day was. And the most amazing thing was that one by one, people started delivering meals to our hospital. And I know that some would say, well, it's just lunch. I'm like, no, it was like the most thoughtful thing, you know, that someone could do for us. And then it was like an everyday occurrence. And we were so thankful that 
I didn't have to go and prep a meal the night before I'd go to work because I just mentally wasn't in that game. You know, that I could eat and sit down and it was just so nice, you know, that the community could do that. Some of them were organized by family um, of patients that we had in the unit or in the hospital, which is just like, it was such a sweet way to say thank you. Which brings me to my next point was, I've always said, I say this to my kids, that um, the simple words of thank you can go a long way. And we have really bared a, a large brunt of, you know, when patients die, it's family angry, rightfully so. But I remember so many times throughout the pandemic of being on the phone with families and giving them, you know, the heart-wrenching news of what's going on and where we're at in their prognosis. Um, that families would just stop and at the end of the call, they would say thank you. And it still wrenches my heart because we don't always need meals or, you know, signs or, uh, you know, pieces in the news. Sometimes all we need is a thank you. And so just to hear the words thank you from a family member truly meant a lot to me. I'll speak for myself. It was the greatest gift somebody could have given me and it kept me going every single day with someone just thought to say thank you. I'm like, you're welcome. It is absolutely my honor and my pleasure to take care of your family member. And I will keep coming back for that, always. Throughout the COVID time, uh, where everything was in lockdown, we had some residents who would bring pizza to us every Friday, and that was a morale booster for us. Um, bringing in lunches, dinners, um, sweets, cards, um, all those different things that the community did to show their support for us. Um, it was just huge because when you go out, you know you're supported, you know you have, you have the back of the community being here. And so, um, and I don't know if you get that in a lot of other departments. And so being, I, I felt very lucky to be a part of this community because they really did step up and help us feel supported and um, yeah, through the, through the whole time. Um, it wasn't just about, you know, local people um, or your hospital kind of celebrating you. Um, we got celebrated by, you know, firefighters and paramedic organizations and policemen and, uh, you know, by different businesses. Um, you know, it, it, it certainly, um, you know, put a little air under our wings, I would say, at the beginning. Um, it's nice to be recognized. It's nice to know that um, <clears throat> the hard work you're putting in and, you know, the exhaustion, whether it's physical or mental, um, is recognized by somebody. The community is incredibly effusive. They always are. They're very incredibly supportive. Uh, we're not lacking in uh, expressions of love of us, and it's just, it's a humbling thing. You know, they really, uh, they're really very supportive, and, and uh, they don't hesitate to show it. So, well, it's, it's been, it's, it's, it's a blessing all the time. Uh, it's been a blessing with this. Um, and it just makes you want to do the job even that much better. So yeah, it's uh, just great people. Just their support was meant so much. Like um, even a coworker's sister, uh, uh, her and her kids and family, they all like made us cookies and sent us notes and that meant so much to us. And especially when we're feeling demoralized, it feels good to, to read these notes and like, okay, we are helping, we are helping. Thank you, you know, to the Chamber of Commerce and to, to, to everyone who uh, really recognized, you know, the, the hard work that we did. Um, you know, it, it, it means a lot to know that, um, that there are, you know, big groups out there that recognize what, um, you know, us little guys are doing up, up front. I just wanted to thank, thank you for this recognition. I, when I heard about it, uh, my mouth kind of dropped because I was like, us? <laughs> really? And, and, and um, I, I feel really special because I love, 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 love this hospital. This hospital is, is my second family. And it feels so good to be recognized for our hard work, our love for our community, and um, all that we, can, we did do and continue to do. And, um, and recognize our um, excellent patient care that we strive to give every day that we work. I just want to say thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for uh, recognizing uh, us as first responders uh, during a pandemic which is unlike any that we've ever experienced. Uh, it means a lot to us to have the community come forward and say, hey, thank you for what you did. Uh, we're not seeking it. It's not something that we're after. 
but it's very, very nice when somebody says, thank you for a job well done, even though we're just doing our jobs. So thank you very much. Well, thank you guys. It's humbling. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to be involved with the department. Uh, like I say, we've got the best men and women in the world. Um, some of the best equipment. Um, uh, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a unique challenge every day and a real blessing. And I pr we appreciate because none, none of this, you can't really give an individual firefighter an award. Um, that's always going to go to the crew. So yeah, we, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Thanks. Well, on behalf of the Palos Verdes Estates Police Department, I want to say thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for acknowledging the work that we've been doing for the last year and a half. Um, and it's an honor to be the recipient of that and an honor to represent such a great department as the Palos Verdes Estates Police Department. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm just one firefighter amongst, you know, thousands. Um, um, but I think that's emblematic of their desire to to say thank you and to uh, and show appreciation to the fire service in general and these other people who've uh, done so much for the community. So I do thank you and I really appreciate um, your generosity and support. I truly want to thank everybody in the Chamber of Commerce for this tremendous honor. Um, I feel very overwhelmed with happiness to be able to represent my hospital and every single caregiver here that I have the honor of working with. And to be thanked in such a way is, I think, the greatest gift, truly the greatest gift. So thank you tremendously from the bottom of my heart, from all of our hearts here. Thank you, and uh, we appreciate it. And we will continue to do what we love doing, which is serving you and our community. Eileen, thank you so much for being with us and sharing all of the stories. They were amazing. And thank you for watching. I'm Maria Sorreo, and we'll see you next time around the peninsula.